Hey guys, Pastor Mike Mosher here, Connection Christian Church. Thanks for joining us on our study through the book of Exodus. Today, I get to share with you from Exodus chapter 26. Before we dive in, will you join me in a word of prayer? Uh, Father God, we thank you so much for all the love that you share with us. Uh, we thank you for providing for us your word and as we dive into it and take a closer look, would you guide this process? Would you help us to, to read it, to understand it, to find something here that we can apply into our lives today? And Father, as we deal with all of the stuff that is going on with uh, this COVID-19 coronavirus, uh, our heart goes out to uh, those who are working in the medical profession. Father, that are trying to figure out uh, the vaccine that are trying to figure out uh, how to, to treat people who come in with these ailments or uh, trying to uh, make sure that they have appropriate space available to take care of the patients who are dealing with this, uh, but also to be able to deal with all of the extra stuff that comes along. And uh, Father, many of them are, are working hard. They're sacrificing uh, time and energy. Uh, they're really working hard to make things um, better for each of us. And so we just ask uh, that you would give them your supernatural strength, your courage, your wisdom as they go about doing what they're doing. And, and Father, we ask that you would use it all to your glory. Um, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey guys, we, uh, we're diving into Exodus 26, and so if you don't already, uh, go ahead and grab your Bible or your app, open it up, Exodus 26. We're not going to go through it in great detail. Most of Exodus 26, uh, much of, of really what we're talking about here in the latter part of Exodus, does not have a direct connection with us today. Uh, but I hope that you'll see, as we've been talking through this, how so much of this foreshadows something greater uh, that's coming at a later time, or in our case, has already been fulfilled. And so Exodus chapter 26 uh, goes into the curtains, <laughs> and it's crazy, right? So all of these amazing, super ornate, very detailed curtains that make up the walls of the tabernacle. The tabernacle was the portable church. And so they couldn't just carry walls and stones and things with them as they made their way through the wilderness into the promised land. And so what they did is they made these curtains. And we know this all too well. Being a portable church ourselves, uh, and some of us having uh, experience in working with other portable churches too, we have this thing called pipe and drape. So pipe and drape is something, it's, it's a pole that's running vertical and then other poles horizontal. Uh, and then we hang curtains from them, and it allows us to separate our spaces out. Uh, and we've done so to kind of block the view of the entry into our, our churches that sits right now, or to the restrooms, or uh, maybe uh, it's blocking off a kid's space. Uh, I've seen churches line the entire front end of their auditorium when they're in like a gym or something with pipe and drape so that you can't see anything but these black curtains that are there. Uh, I've seen churches in, in large auditoriums use it to kind of shield uh, all of the extra seating and keep it away. Many, many different uses for all of this, uh, but what we see in Exodus 26 is they're building all of these huge curtains and there's very specific details given to this amazing craftsmanship going in. But it's to create the walls of this worship space, this dwelling place of God. And inside of it is the holy place. And then inside of that is the most holy place. And I'm going to read to you from, Psalm, or excuse me, from Exodus 26, starting in verse 31. It says this, And you shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen. It shall be made with cherubim skillfully worked into it, and you shall hang it on four pillars of acacia overlaid with gold, with hooks of gold on four bases of silver. And you shall hang the veil from the clasps, and bring the ark of the testimony in there within the veil. And the veil shall separate for you the holy place from the most holy. You shall put the mercy seat on the ark of the testimony in the most holy place. 
and you shall set the table outside the veil, and the lamp stand on the south side of the tabernacle, opposite the table, and you shall put the table on the north side. Now this little paragraph within the chapter uh, talks to us about a specific curtain, the veil that goes between the holy place and the most holy place. And the significance here uh, is a couple of things. Number one is this is where God is the dwelling. So within the Ark of the Covenant, right, the, the big box that we talked about yesterday that holds within it the, the Ten Commandments, the other commands that God has uh, given to Moses, and it's got that amazing uh, top to it with the, the angels over the top. That's going inside, and this is the dwelling place of God. Now, the only person who could go into the most holy place was the great high priest. And the great high priest could only do it once a year on the Day of Atonement to offer uh, sacrifices for his sin and the sins of the people. And so this was representational, this curtain, of the sin that separates us from God. All of the people are on one side and God is on the other and they needed an intermediary to go in between and to offer the sacrifice. And of course, they did this time and time and time again every year. They had to renew this covenant with God. They had to know that the wages of sin in their life was death, right? And so these animals were sacrificed on their behalf. Well, I want to take you on a bit of a journey uh, through the, the rest of Scripture so that we can see kind of this temple thing playing out. Uh, so a couple of places that we can look at, uh, one of which would be uh, in Kings, we see the transition from a tabernacle to a temple. Temple is a more permanent structure, and Solomon built the first temple, and uh, judging by that, it's 30 cubits high. So 30 cubits, a cubit would be roughly 18 inches, a foot and a half, so about 45 feet tall. Uh, would be this structure, and specifically these curtains. <laughs> Those are huge, right? And that's not, that's not the end of it. Uh, so Solomon's temple didn't survive. Herod built another temple, this temple even bigger, uh, coming in at uh, about 40 cubits, so about 60 feet tall, uh, according to the uh, historian Josephus. Uh, Jewish tradition would also tell us that these curtains were roughly a hand breadth or hand width, in depth. And if you measure across, uh, roughly about three and a half, four inches. Now, assuming that this is true, four inches thick of this, this purple and blue and scarlet yarn and the fine linen all weaved together and all of the little intricacies going into it, this is an amazing curtain or veil that separates the holy place from the most holy place the dwelling place of God. And so we see in Matthew chapter 27, verses 50 and 51, and it's also recorded in other gospel accounts, Jesus, when he died, the temple curtain was torn in two. And it was torn uh, from top to bottom. That's pretty impressive, right? That this four-inch curtain is ripped and not from maybe the way that we would anticipate, uh, but the opposite way. This was a miracle. This was uh, something that would have gotten a lot of people's attention. This became something that was woven into the historical accounts, whether you're a believer or not. Wow, this four-inch curtain was torn. Now, the significance there would be, uh, and we see this in Hebrews chapters 9 and 10, that Jesus uh, was that great high priest. We talked about last Sunday, he's after the order of Melchizedek. Uh, we're going to be talking about it again this Sunday when we talk about the atonement, the blood sacrifice. But when Jesus offered up his body as the sacrifice, that curtain was torn because we now, through the blood of Jesus Christ, have a power to enter into the presence of God. By In Hebrews uh, chapter 10, it says, by a new and living way. This is Jesus Christ. The one sacrifice for all. Wow, this is powerful. So our sin separates us from God. And this atonement on a regular basis, confessing our sins, offering sacrifice before God, keeps us on the right track, but it's only truly made complete when Jesus offers himself. And maybe that's why he says in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. 
uh, we can read on um, in Romans chapter 8, verses 38 through 39. Where it says, what shall separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord? The answer is quite simply nothing. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Because Jesus stepped in and he provided that way. In John chapter 2 verse 19, we see Jesus talk about the idea of destroying the temple. Destroying his body. And in three days he will raise it up. Now, they probably thought he was talking about the physical temple. The one that they could see right there in Jerusalem. But he was talking about his body. You see, from the beginning, God has wanted to be present with us. He was there in the garden with Adam and Eve, but our sin separated us from him because he couldn't be in the presence of sin. His holiness would not allow that to happen. But he became present in many ways, one of them being in the Ark of the Covenant, which was placed inside of the most holy place. This is later uh, a transition to the temple. And when that temple is destroyed, Herod builds another temple. The Ark of the Covenant isn't even in it. But we still have the same symbolism that's taking place. In this presence of God is now in the person of Jesus Christ. God became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Right, So Jesus was God in the flesh. He was present with us. And then we're told again in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 by the Apostle Paul, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? So for all of us who believe that Jesus is the Son of God, we've been baptized into him. We are promised in the book of Acts chapter 2 that we will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. God's presence living in us. And then again, uh, we can go to Revelation, very end of the Bible, and we're talking about in chapters uh, twenty or chapter twenty-one, verse twenty-two, where it says, "And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb." There's no temple, right? There's no need for the dwelling place of God because God is present. God is there. The the very existence of heaven is because you and I get to be with God forever. I'm going to kick back just a few verses. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. And this is really what God wants for us. So what we see in this whole thing is that the temple curtain separated us from God because it represented our sin. And we had to continually uh, provide sacrifices, atonement, through a mediator to have God's blessing. Uh, we read in uh, 1 Kings chapter 6, uh, God speaking to Solomon when he's building the temple, and he says, Now the word of the Lord came to Solomon concerning this house that you're building. If you walk in my statutes and obey my rules and keep my commandments and walk in them, then I will establish my word with you, which I spoke to David your father, and I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people. This whole thing from the very beginning is conditional upon our obedience. Now, that doesn't mean that you and I earn our salvation. No, it's a gift from God. We cannot earn our salvation. But we should be living in obedience as a response to the salvation, to the sacrifice of Jesus. And this is true uh, even when we get to Revelation 21, where it talks about you know what you can do to inherit eternal life. And that is hugely important, guys. So uh, what's your next step? What's your big takeaway from this message? Well, I would suggest if you don't know who Jesus is, it's time to get to know Jesus, right? The way, the truth, and the life, because he is the only way into the presence of God. And then once you get there, once you get there, you need to live in submission to the Holy Spirit of God that is present within you. And when you do, it will lead to obedience. And that obedience lived out, it, it shines before other people, but it also uh, lets you live the way that God has intended for you. And the promise then is that you and I get to be with God forever in heaven. However, if we live in rebellion to the Spirit of God within us, we do our own thing anyway, the chances are we will not get to see heaven. So what will you do with this information? Well, I guess that's up to you, right? But the good news is this. God loves us. And he sent his one and only son to die for us. 
and there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus gave us the power to enter into the presence of God by a new and living way. Live in that presence. Have a great week.